Hello and welcome to Host 101 Fun Approach, delivered to you by, as usual, Samer. Uh, we'll have a quick recap on what we did so far. We learned ROS basics and how to develop some packages that have to do with the basic ROS utilities. So we're dealing purely with ROS as ROS. We didn't include any other plugin and basically designed some uh, packages or projects that have to do with transferring data and you know performing some operations all right so that was just ROS for the sake of ROS and we were introduced to some ROS utilities that we could use in our projects like bags services and messages in order to help us like create nodes that could perform uh, specific tasks but we didn't actually have quite an idea about um, what are we going to use these utilities for actually in our robotic development process. So, so far we were dealing with data types and stuff like that, but we didn't actually implement something physical. We ran a small simulation uh, with some kinematic concepts, and that's the closest we got to an actual robotic project. But now we need to work on a real robotic project, and although we'll be using a simulation for that, the simulation is considered to be you know, a very um, sufficient uh, replacement of reality so far. So we will be using a Gazebo environment, and Gazebo is a great simulation tool with a very strong physics engine that could help you develop your projects without actually having the actual hardware. And the results would be pretty similar to what would happen in real life. So Gazebo is basically the tool for development. You as a ROS developer and many and actually many ROS developers across the world uh, you know work remotely uh, far from the working environment or far from the lab and they get to use these simulations in order to produce fully functioning products or packages that they could pass on to their employers so that they could, their employers could deploy them on actual robots and then it works. Sometimes there are slight differences between reality and simulation and this is because no simulation is perfect. All right? So it's like the matrix basically. I mean if 99% of the population could accept the program then there is always this 1% of people that would rebel against the machine world. And if you don't get my reference then you have to watch the matrix movies. Uh, all right, uh, so but these differences are quite slight, so would have to do with 99% of the population. So you you basically get to be the architect in the movie now. So what is Gazebo? Gazebo is a simulation environment, as I said before, where kinetics are included. We talked about kinematics before, and we defined them as that uh, you know portion of physics that has to do with. Uh, uh, physical variables that are not related to forces or uh, uh, moments of inertia or uh, uh, masses. They are just pure kinematics like velocity, position, um, acceleration and stuff like that. So we're basically studying the motion of the particle without having to study uh, the body itself. So in Gazebo, it's different because we include both kinematics and kinetics into the simulation. So kinetics is the portion of physics that have to include, or that has to include uh, masses, inertias, and stuff like that, uh, in order to you know constitute a product that is more similar to the actual product than just a kinematic uh, replica of the actual robot. So we're going to investigate Gazebo features as well and what it has to offer to us. And we're going to launch some TurtleBot 3 simulations. And what a TurtleBot 3 is, it's like the, the kinetic version of our TurtleSim robots. Our TurtleSim robot, robot was a little bit cartoonish and it only included kinematic values or kinematic variables that we could manipulate. But when it comes to TurtleBot 3, that's the actual thing. And it's, a, it's an actual robot, uh, by the way, that is used in many academic institutions. So if you learn how to use TurtleBot 3 uh, using simulation, then you'll probably be very good uh, when you have like the actual robot and you want to work on it. And actually TurtleBot 3 
is a family of robots, not just one robot. So there are multiple models of TurtleBot 3, like you got the Waffle Pie uh, TurtleBot uh, robot, you got the Burger TurtleBot robot. So we'll begin to work on some of these versions. And of course, the fun starts here. This is the actual fun, and you're going to enjoy this part of the course more than the first part. So let's dive in. So what we're going to do now is that we first need to download the packages that include all the files related to the simulation of TurtleBot 3. So I'm going to open my browser and I'm going to type TurtleBot 3 eManual, which is sort of like the manual or the documentation of the TurtleBot 3 robot online. And it's somehow similar to the Ross Wiki, but it is, uh, you know, uh, associated with uh, TurtleBot 3 robots. So I'm going to type TurtleBot 3 eManual. And then I'm going to open, uh, yeah, here it is, Robotis uh, eManual. So there are, uh, this documentation contains uh, so much information about uh, the TurtleBot three robots and by the way here's the third bot three robot Th this is the burger version and this is the waffle pie version and these are the actual live versions uh, actual real life versions and we are gonna you know discuss some aspects so I'm gonna go to the simulation because we are gonna deal with simulations in this course and I'm gonna start with the first uh, topic here which is gazebo simulation so first of all, we're going to follow uh, some guidelines here. But while following the guidelines and copying commands, we need to understand what each of these commands uh, does and what it entails. And uh, when we download the files, we need to investigate these files and figure out how Gazebo actually works. So first of all, you need to install the simulation package and you'll find commands here that will help you uh, like uh, download the package. And then you'll find here, for example, that the first command uh, is changing your directory towards the Catkin workspace source. So that means we're going to download, for example, a package because we're going to the source directory of our Catkin workspace. So that will probably instruct you to download some package there. And then you're going to find a command called git clone. And what git clone is, um, well, basically git is like a family of commands that have to do with, you know, uploading your files to the cloud, for example, and getting files from the cloud. So it's like, um, you know, it's a, an upload download feature. And that's the simple description uh, for uh, the git family. And of course, it's a very professional tool that is used by many professionals in order to update their projects online in case you're collaborating in your project with multiple engineers uh, from different parts of the world, for example, then the Git tools are quite helpful. But that's another topic. We will not focus on Git tools right now. So this particular command clone here is like the download button for Windows, for example. So what, you, what you're trying to do here is getting a copy of uh, the files that are located somewhere online. And this is the uh, URL where, uh, you know, uh, the files uh, are placed. So you'll find that there is a GitHub uh, directory here. And what GitHub is, it's like, you know, it's like the Google Drive for ROS developers and many other developers. It doesn't have to be ROS only. You can find embedded uh, C developers here. You can find MATLAB developers. You can find all types of projects that have to do with programming on GitHub. So GitHub is like a platform and where people like upload their codes and just show their codes off to other people so that they could download them or add to them or modify them. So yeah, it's a collaborative working environment. So what this command is going to do is that it's it's going to copy that directory. Basically, it's going to get you like a zipped version of that uh, uh, library or uh, code or whatever. Then you're going to go, you're going to change your directory back to the Catkin workspace, and then you're going to uh, type Catkin make, All right? So that's like two commands in one line. Uh, because you're including an and sign between them. 
Uh, you can just execute each command on its own in one line. Uh, so we can type cd catkin workspace and then we can type catkin make or you can just include them in one line if you're kind of in a hurry. All right. So basically what you're going to do is that you're going to open up your terminal and you're going to copy the commands. For example, I'm going to copy the first command here. Sorry. I'm going to copy this command here and then I'm going to place it on my terminal. So I'm going to paste it. And then I'm in the catkin workspace direct directory. And then, and then I'm going to execute this command here. But I already executed it before, so I'm not going to execute it now. But you have to execute it because it's your first time. All right, and then you're gonna head back to the catkin workspace and then catkin make. Catkin make is actually one of the catkin build tools. It's like a different tool for catkin build, all right? So you can execute it, no problem, all right? If you can use, if you if you want to use catkin build, it's fine as well. So you can either just copy that or you can just go to the workspace and uh, catkin build. It's up to you, really. It doesn't matter. So uh, that would be it. And by the way, if you if you have a different ca uh, workspace name, uh, for example, I sometimes call my workspace something other than Catkin Workspace. And for uh, for you for those of you who like uh, named their workspace uh, uh, like using a different name uh, from the very beginning, then you have to include your workspace name here instead of Catkin. For example, if I made up a workspace called Sam Workspace, for example, then I have to replace Catkin here with Sam. As we said, Catkin Workspace is a conventional name. It doesn't have to be, uh, you, you know, like the right name. There is no right and wrong when it comes to that. All right. So when you do that and when you navigate to your uh, directory, and actually I did download that to a workspace called Sam Workspace. Uh, so I gotta head back to my bash RC file. All right, before I forget. So uh, um, well, yeah, here it is. So the bash RC is here. So I gotta source my Sam workspace uh, uh, instead of the Catkin workspace because my project is located there. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to replace Catkin with Sam. And I'm going to save. And then I'm going to hide back those stuff. Sorry. Seems like I'm missing something. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'm going to head to the Sam workspace. It could be Catkin workspace in your case. As I said, the name doesn't matter. What matters is that you source the right workspace and you're downloading to the right workspace. So I'm going to head to my SRC directory here. And as we can see, well, there are other packages that I developed in the past. We'll focus on these two packages. And these are the two packages that are supposed to appear once you unzip your folder. All right. So you'll find a file called turtlebot 3 simulations which is the package that includes all the information regarding the setup of the simulation environment for your turtlebot 3 robot. And we've got turtlebot 3 auto race 2020. Uh, I'm not sure actually if that uh, is also included in that uh, folder or is it just something that I downloaded later. But anyway, I'm not I'm, I'm not really interested in that part now. I'm just interested in the TurtleBot 3 simulations package, which contains uh, this, this, the simulation setup that we need. All right, so we're going to head back here. And then you'll find here some commands that instruct you to launch your simulation world. So what is a world? So the first thing we gotta investigate here is something called right so we get we're gonna head to the turtle bar three simulations and then you'll find uh, three files here I'm interested in the turtle bar three gazebo all right folder so it's kind of a package that it's that kind of, pa of package that does not follow the uh, you know, the naming convention that we agreed upon before. So I can't find scripts and launch and stuff like that. So it's like a package of several packages. So I'm going to focus on the TurtleBot 3 gazebo sub package. You can call it that if you want. So you'll find that there are, you know, new folders that we're not used to. 
I mean, I can find a launch folder, and this we've seen before, but then you will find the SRC folder as well. But there is an RVIS folder, and there's an include folder, and there are models and the worlds. All right. So for a simulation package, for something that includes data on a simulation setup, you will find that things are a little bit different. So first of all, you'll find something or folder here that includes the models. So what are the models? Let's open it up. You'll find that here you can find like the models of your robot, for example. So I've got a, a folder that contains the information on the TurtleBot 3 Burger uh, TurtleBot robot. You can also find uh, information on the TurtleBot 3 Waffle, the TurtleBot 3 Waffle Pie, right? And you can find, you know, some other uh, models. So what is a model? So basically, in your simulation, you gotta have some objects, right? You gotta have robots, for example. You gotta have a table. You gotta have a chair. You gotta have like um, a traffic sign. So this is a simulation of an actual uh, world or an actual like um, um, physical situation. So you gotta have objects and you gotta have models. So what are these? What these models are? Are like objects in your simulation that have something to do with your simulation in terms of you know um, physical existence so for example you gotta have a robot for example so you gotta have like a turtle bot 3 burger in case you want to simulate a situation where your robot is navigating in an environment and this robot is a turtle bot 3 burger so let's open it up you'll find that you have some XML files here one of them is called the SDF or having an extension called SDF. So let's open it up and see what kind of information are available within that file. So you can find that, well, here's the XML version. That means like the language version, like Python 3, for example, when you use Python, something similar, right? So you'll find data like the model name. So the model name is TurtleBot 3 Burger, and the name is used to reference that model in order for Gazebo to understand or label that model that's going to be available in the simulation. And you're going to f you will find something called link. And what links are, well, basically, whenever you have a robot, it's constructed of a set of links that are connected together through joints. So, for example, when it comes to your wheeled robot here, we're using a wheeled robot. So, it'll have something like the base of the robot, which is the chassis, for example. And then you gotta have some joints which represents the, you know, the rotation of the motor or the rotational uh, motion that is transferred from the motor to the wheels. So that represents like a rotary joint or a joint that is responsible for rotation. So you gotta have a link called the base, for example, which is the base of the robot. You can call it the chassis, you call it whatever. And then you'll have some information on that link. So that link must have some pose right so it's like uh, a pose that is uh, related to the origin of that uh, model so each model has for example an origin of its own uh, so we, we got to determine that the center of the base is located at a particular distance for example uh, from the origin of that model and you've got the inertia components and by inertia we means moments of inertia and and for those of you who are familiar with physical quantities, the moment of inertia represents the resistance against rotation. It's like mass, but mass is for the linear case. Moment of inertia is the resistance against rotational motion. So you've got like uh, six uh, moments of inertia. We're only interested in the IXX, the IX, the IYY, and the IZZ because usually the other moments of inertia are zero, like the, uh, the IXY and the IYZ and stuff like that. So we're only interested in basically the, the basic moments of inertia around about the x-axis, about the y-axis, and about the z-axis. And we've got some other data, like the mass. So the mass is usually describing kilograms, which is the resistance to linear motion. And we've got some collision properties. So unlike a kinematic simulation, in a dynamic simulation or a kinetic simulation, you're expected to hit some objects. So you have to define collision properties for your object in order to simulate the collision forces between uh, different objects. 
So you'll have like a collision property for this base, which is the base collision. So it defines like the area or the volume of the body, which is supposed to collide with other objects upon contact and its size and geometry and stuff like that. And you've got some visual properties as well. So these visual properties represent like the color of your uh, body, for example, uh, and uh, its size, for example, and the meshing data. The mesh is like when you have a complex CAD file for your robot, for example, or when you have a complex shape, it's usually divided into uh, a number of meshes because a computer cannot understand a full shape without digitizing that shape. So in order to digitize that shape, we cut it into a series of meshes that are, you know, like um, connected together to form, uh, you know, the closest digital image for that real object. And if you like, if you uh, kind of old, like uh, PlayStation 1 kind of old, you can find that the animations in the old versions of PlayStation, like PlayStation 1, were not, you know, were not quite natural because there were, there were so, uh, the meshes were so big. So when you model a person, for example, you can see that that person's body and face is not really as accurate as the, the real thing because it basically, what, what, how it got that uh, shape is that it, got the real shape or it got an image for example of the football player or the soccer or the soccer player depending on whether you're American or uh, you know European uh, so your definition of the game all right uh, might differ but you get what I mean so you have like that player and we have a real image of that player but what we do is that we create a mesh of um, that player's shape so these meshes are like overlapped together to form a digital image and when whenever the meshes are big or large you can find that the accuracy of their presentation decreases. So in newer versions of PlayStation like PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5, I don't know if there's a PlayStation 6 right now, but you can find that the shapes of the players are more accurate because now we got more processing powers so we can create more meshes and we can make the shape more accurate All right so this is basically what the visual properties are about and you got the color and you got stuff like that so you've got other links so you've got something called a lidar link and what a lidar is it's a sensor that produces laser beams and these laser beams are like hit an object and then get back to me so I can calculate the time of flight and I can detect how far that object is or the depth or the depth data of that object. All right, we'll get to that soon enough. So all right, and that sensor is a, has a body, so it also has collision properties and it has visual properties. All right? And so on and so forth. You can find uh, a model for the wheels, for example. Or not a model because the, the robot itself is a model we can find a link name here or a link called the left wheel uh, and the right wheel of course and well you got joints as well we discussed joints before so links are like the actual physical parts and joints represent the types of motion that exist between those sh those bodies so for example uh, the body might be static but the wheel which is attached to the body is moving so you gotta uh, form some kind of join between these two bodies in order to represent or understand the motion uh, or the relative motion between these two bodies and this is what a model uh, this is what a model uh, file uh, encompasses uh, of course you don't have to be really familiar with all these coding uh, conventions because I myself, I don't, you know, like have um, a photographic memory just to type all these commands and drill them into my head and just use them again to create my own model, right? So you don't have to stress yourself about it. As long as you do understand what each of these, you know, uh, variable, variables mean or means, 
So you don't have to stress yourself about the rest of the details and the, the XML language and stuff like that. You just un get to understand what this uh, model is all about. So you get the, like the big picture and that's enough. Right. You can find other XML files like the model configuration here. Um, for example, it's like, um, you know, the brand here. It just describes the name of the author. Uh, so the author who, who actually built that model or wrote the code of that model. Uh, and his email and a description, which is turtleplot 3 burger and the name and the version of the SDF file. So that's like, you know, some data on the file itself. And here you'll find, um, you know, another description. It's actually the same thing as the last file we we opened. And by the way, a value joint means uh, like a rotary joints, a joint that rotates or describes rotational motion. And on the other side, when you have like linear motion, you call the joint prismatic joint. Uh, it's quite the same file. I don't I don't quite get the difference actually. Maybe it's the difference in you know the version of the SDF file. Maybe it has two versions here. Yeah, this is 1.5, and this is 1.4. So yeah, he has like two versions of uh, the SDF file. One version is 1.4, and one version of is 1.5. And maybe that has to do with compatibility issues or something. So I don't care as long as I, I do understand what this model is all about. All right, we can find other models as well. For example, this is a turtle bar three house. Um, and yeah, it's like a model for an actual house. It's called the third of bar three house. So it's like, uh, you know, some uh, environment, uh, or not an environment, because environment isn't accurate in this case. It's like a model for a house. It's it's like a building, and it describes that building, uh, how many walls, and what is the shape of the walls, and what is the size of the walls, and what is the mass of the walls, and the moment of uh, the moments of inertia of the walls stuff like that so it's pretty much the same thing and you can find actually some extra um, properties like friction um, you can find uh, you know some descriptions for the material itself and stuff like that and you know the the color and uh, the shadows and transparency stuff like that so I'm not really interested in that model because, you know, usually objects are not that, you know, we usually don't investigate objects in our uh, in our simulation, like walls and stuff like that, because they tend to be pretty simple. And I don't usually need to, like, edit the file or something. I probably just, if I need to, edit uh, some property of the robot. And this is not recommended for, like... Um, a standard type of robot like the Turtle Bot 3 because you're gonna buy it off the shelf eventually so you can change these properties like size and shape and you know size of the wheels for example maybe you can change the color if you want your simulation to look cool but we usually don't change the physical properties right so these are the models so we got something called the worlds and what a world is, it's like a collection of models that are grouped together in order to form the simulation world. It's like the matrix itself. So let's think of the models as like the agents of the system. All right. You can call them like individual programs all right? uh, or objects. All right. But the world is like the whole simulation environment. This is the version of the matrix where people are trapped. So we've got here multiple worlds. So we've got an empty world. So as the name suggests, this must be a world where you have nothing but the ground. All right. And you've got like an auto race world. So this is like um, a racing environment. All right. Where you can find like um, traffic lights and some, you know, some streets and stuff like that. And you've got a house world. So that suggests that we use some models of houses that we uh, so before in the model folder in this environment, you've got like Turtle Bot 3 World, which is a world uh, designed specifically for turtles. All right. So this is basically like the world. And if you open up one of these files, for example, so it's an um, 
yeah, it here mentions the SDF version for the models that we're going to use, for example, and some parameters of this world, like the name, uh, and some, you know, parameters of this world. As we said before, there are programs that control, like, the lighting uh, conditions of that world. Is it shadowy? Is it sunny? Is it uh, dusty? Is it whatever? All right. Um, so there's a model of the sun, actually, and this is pretty funny, you know. So there's a model or there's a program that is, you know, responsible for how sunny the simulation is. There's a ground plane, right, which is basically the ground. And you've got a physics engine, so you've got some physical, you know, aspects of the simulation. And the physics here, ODE means ordinary differential equation. And for those of you who are not familiar with calculus or, you know, that partition of physics which has to do a lot with calculus, whenever you develop a simulation of a real world, a real world can, can, a real world can be described in terms of differential equations. So most of the natural phenomena are described using differential equations. So in order for you to simulate that world, you have to solve these differential equations to get like the evolution of the states of the world uh, with time. So for example, when you design a simulation that simulates the number of bacteria, for example, in a sample. So it starts with, you know, a small number of bacteria and then this bacteria um, multiplies, right? And that is actually an exponential model. So you'll find that the derivative of the number of uh, uh, the, uh, the bacteria, which is like the rate of change of the number of bacteria, is equal to like uh, uh, the number of bacteria that are currently there. Um, or something like the exponential. I can't remember really. The details of that model it's like um, yeah the, the, the yeah it's like an exponential model because for the exponential models you you'll find that the derivative is actually the same as the uh, you know the derivative of the exponential is an exponential so that's how they figured out the exponential function right by assuming that the derivative is actually equal to the actual quantity, all right? So that, that one defines exponential growth, and therefore this is a phenomena that can be described in terms of some differential equation, and that was actually the start of the science of, you know, mathematical differential equations, as far as I know, all right? So any other phenomena is usually described in terms of ordinary differential equations, like, for example, electric circuits, stuff like that, so you gotta have a physics engine that deals with you know a certain solver that tries to solve these equations the equations of the system and tries to you know estimate how this system will or system stage states will change with time and this is what a physics engine is all about so i've got a real-time update like the update rate because because for example you know the computer is always digital and it works uh, with a specific sampling time, for example, because the computer cannot compute everything instantly. So it has like a sampling time. For example, I will update the status of the simulation every one microsecond, for example, right? Because I need to do some computations and I need to finish some uh, calculations in order for me to update the state of the model. So I'll just renew the state of the model uh, every uh, like every period of time all right so I've got some parameters of the solver and there are multiple solvers out there and each exact uh, uh, actually every simulation tool or every simulation software has its own uh, solvers all right so there are some parameters of the solver and I'm not really interested in elaborating on these uh, solver parameters because they are like very specific and uh, usually designed by the simula simulation designers themselves. So I, I needn't worry about this, you know, uh, this physics engine because that's very specific and a very specialized topic that I don't want to go through now, right? And there is uh, the load uh, world, com uh, like the load world in includes the number of includes 
or the models that you're going to include into that world. Um, and the scene, some scene parameters like the uh, ambience, the background, uh, the shadows, stuff like that. And there are some like parameters like the camera because you're viewing the simulation through a camera, by the way. And this camera is designed to give you a certain view of the simulation, like you're viewing the simulation from the north or the south or the east or the west or stuff like that. So that's basically what a world file is. Then you gotta have a launch folder here, right? So this launch folder, as we've known so far, is responsible for launching some stuff, right? So first we use the launch file in order to launch some nodes, and then we used it to launch like or load the static parameters or like the parameter server constants. And it can also be used to like launch worlds, like launch the gazebo simulation, right? So if you open up one of these simulation files, let's just open the TurtleBot 3 world launch. So it, it gonna, it's going to have some arguments, and these arguments are pretty much like variables in Python. So we've got arguments here, which, which is the equivalent of a variable in XML, for example. All right, so we've got a variable called model, for example. And this model is going to be determined by the user. We've got the X position, the Y position, and the Z position of the robot, which are given uh, values like negative 2.0, negative 0.5, and 0. These are like the initial coordinates of the robot in that world environment with respect to the global frame. And we discussed global frames before, except that here in Gazebo we'll have the, the full three coordinates, or we have six degrees of freedom, right? Because we'll have X, Y, Z, Roll, pitch, and yell. So there are three angles because whenever you try to describe an object in three space or describe its location, you actually use six coordinates, right? So any pro any object in three D space has six degrees of freedom. But to be honest, with model with with mobile robots or wheeled robots, to be specific, not just mobile robots mobile wheel robots, you still have three degrees of freedom only because some degrees of freedom are restricted unless you're like um, your robot tilts or uh, just rolls over or you know uh, have some particular type of accident that causes it to you know go off track and just fall for example but usually we model 3d uh, sorry uh, we model wheel robots to have three degrees of freedom Except that it actually has six degrees of freedom in the simulation, but two of them or three of them are restricted uh, due to collision forces, for example, and ground reaction forces and stuff like that. But they do exist. They're restricted in terms of forces, but they do exist and they're kind of free, except for the existence of forces that restrict those motions. And we got to load the, you know, the, the, the world uh, file here. So you gotta find the world file that we're gonna launch here. So we're gonna get that world file which in turn includes some models. So the models will be loaded by default into the world file and the world file will be loaded into the gazebo simulation itself through this launch file. Right. There are some arguments like posed which means do you want to pose the simulation so its default value is false because I don't want to pose the simulation. I've just started so it doesn't make any sense to pose it and uh, the simulation time for example like uh, use the simulation time which is true because I want to display the simulation time and I want my simulation to keep running and GUI is like you know the graphical user interface do you want the graphical user interface to be there and that is true because sometimes I need to move some objects into the simulation using the GUI instead of just uh, logging into the models and logging into the world file to change them. So sometimes you could change uh, stuff in the simulation by using GUI instead of logging into the XML files. All right, headless. Uh, I don't really know <laughs> what headless refers to. Um, and there's a debugging feature that you set to false by default. All right, so. Uh, this is the robot description, and it has to do something called, uh, or a type of files called the Shakru files. And the Shakru files are like uh, files that include, you know, 
the geometrical details of my robot and how it looks like. So it's like, um, you know, a step file. I don't know if you're familiar with CAD files, but it's like some sort of a file that loads like the visuals of my product or my robot here. All right. So, of course, you got the gazebo uh, node, right? And you've got like um, a node which is responsible for spawning robot models. So, sp what spawning means is that you have a certain robot, for example, or you have a certain model of a robot that you need to load into your simulation. So, you need to get that model. For example, here you loaded the world file. And the world file itself is like um, composed of some objects and the sun and trees and streets and stuff like that. So they're just static objects and you need to load your robot into that simulation, right? Into, or, into, or interact with that world within the simulation. So it's basically like getting one of, you know, the resistance members in the Matrix movies into the matrix simulation by plugging in some cable into their heads and stuff like that. Uh, so this is basically the same thing right here. So what you're trying to do here is spawning that model and that means you're spawning your robot or like generating your robot digital image into the simulation. All right. So that's what the spawning is and, and this is pretty uh, and this is a pretty important command by the way that you're going to deal with a lot. So this spawning model will contain some um, parameters like the spawn URDF, right? Uh, which is the name of that node. And you've got some arguments, which is the URDF or Chakra or whatever the extension. I don't care about the extension name. It's just like the description of the robot model, all right? Um, and you've got like the arguments of the position of the robot. So where do you want your robot to be loaded into the simulation? So it's the, like the, the initial X and Y coordinates of the robot, X, Y, and Z coordinates. And there's a parameter which is the robot description. And that's it, that's pretty much the launch file. And again, you needn't worry about uh, the XML language here because Whenever I want to, for example, create a new world, right? I'm just going to copy some lines and I'm going to change some parameters. This is what we usually do as ROS developers. You can't find a ROS developer who's really like ha have that photographic memory of all commands that exist within ROS, as I said before. So you need to worry about the, uh, um, the shape of the commands and how complex they look, all right? As long as you get the general idea behind these commands and how these files work, then that's enough. So I'm going to close that, right? So we actually ran through the most important um, folders or files within this gazebo simulation. So let's get back here and do the actual thing, like try to launch this simulation world, all right? So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to copy these commands, right? So first I need to determine uh, what type uh, or what is the model of my TurtleBot 3 robot. So here I'm selecting Burger, for example, which is a funny name, I know. It's, it's not an actual Burger, though. So I'm going to paste the command and just hit Enter. And what this command does, it's, it's, like, it's like responsible for loading... Uh, you know the type of the robot into the terminal. It's like I define a variable within the terminal, for example, and I determine that the turtle bot three model variable is going to be equal to burger, so that when the launch file is launched, uh, and it, it's got some like, let's open it up again. It's got some argument here, right? So, for example, we're gonna launch the empty world, I guess. So we're gonna start with that. So you'll find the total bot 3 model here. So we need a reference to that variable. So what I did here is that I defined the total bot 3 model to be burger, so that when you get to that line within the launch file, the launch file will use the find command. And if you remember, 
this is like the find command so search for that uh, model package in order to get its information right so yeah this is what I did I'm gonna get back here and then I'm gonna launch the third of bot 3 uh, empty world uh, launch file so this is supposed to launch my world uh, which is an empty world and at the same time launch or spawn my robot into the simulation so I'm gonna paste that and as you can see it's the usual ROS launch command structure where you just type ROS launch and then the, uh, the package and this in this case this is the package that we've just downloaded which is the turtle bot 3 gazebo package which contains information about my worlds and my models and my robots and stuff like that and then I'm selecting the specific launch file that I need to launch and by the way somebody might comment on the fact that I did not uh, run the raw score All right and you're right I should have run it but um, thing is when you run gazebo and when you run these ROS, ROS launch files you'll find that gazebo and the raw score are loaded by, de uh, by default so you need to worry about it if you want to run the raw score uh, in, uh, in the very beginning then it's okay if you don't want to it will be you know like uh, loaded anyway uh, all right this is uh, unexpected it's neither a launch file and package um, so ba -ba -ba -ba. I did change my my bash rc directory, right? So let's open up a new terminal. Maybe that was an old terminal. So I'll try to do that again. Uh, TurtleBot3, yeah. Uh, so the TurtleBot3 model uh, was not determined because I opened up a new terminal, so it forgot the value of that variable. So I need to copy it again. Then I'm gonna paste it here, and then I'm gonna copy that ROS launch command again. Hopefully it will work this time. So I'm gonna paste it. And yeah, it's now running. So probably I uh, opened up an old terminal. Uh, the old terminal had the old like sourcing command, which sourced the Catkin workspace, which does not have the the gazebo simulation package, right? So I changed the bash RC, but I didn't close up the old terminal. So the old terminal still had the old sourcing. So I had to open up like a new terminal in order for the new sourcing to start working, right? So this is basically my environment. This is my gazebo environment. You'll find a GUI and then you'll find your world. I'm currently viewing this world. I'm currently like the architect in the matrix, which used to, you know, like view Neo through, um, uh, some TV screens, right? So now, yeah, I'm currently like pretty much the architect here, and you can find that I'm in control of the simulation, right? Uh, so you'll find my GUI here, which includes like some moving commands. This is a move, right? So it just moves your camera, right? So that you can view from different uh, viewpoints. You can also have rotation here, which rotates. It's actually still moving, <laughs> right? It was supposed to rotate, but I think you're not able to rotate the world oh, or the ground itself. Not sure. You can control like the spotlight. Yeah, there's a spotlight on my robot right now, and I uh, I can move. I can basically move the spotlight here, so I can put my robot under the spotlight. You can control something called a point light. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, it's, a, it's like a bigger spot or something. And there are rays here, I think directional light. Yeah, it's like light everywhere. All right. And you've got some other commands. I can actually um, like include models. Now this is change the view angle. So I can view it from the home, which is the default view of my camera. And I can view from the back, so let's view from the back. So I'm currently viewing my simulation or my world from the back. I can, you know, this is the, the bottom, 
I guess. Yeah, so I'm currently viewing, I'm currently having my, my Superman x-rays going through the ground and then, you know, like, seeing the robot. And I can view from the top. So this is the normal view. Uh, a little bit, actually, it looks kind of funny from... Yeah, it's the shadow, right? So it's the shadow effect. I thought my robot was, like, inclined a little bit. And we can get back to, you know, like the home view. I can actually, like, include some solids into the simulation. So I can pick up a solid here and I can put it here. So it's no longer an empty world. And I can also delete it by pressing the delete button. By selecting this object and pressing the delete button, I can include a cylinder and put it wherever I want. And this cylinder actually has some information here, like where it's where it's posed, where it's located. So I can change that actually and let it be five, for example, and see where it goes. So it went somewhere here, yeah. So yeah, I can change these values from the GUI directly, and I can delete that object if I don't if I no longer want it. And by the way, here you'll find that the world here. Is flexible that means I can include new models because the unit cylinder that I've just got into the simulation is like a new, a new model right it's basically the model of a cylinder that I included through the GUI by the way if I try to close the simulation now it will ask me if you want to keep this model or of the unit cylinder uh, there if you want to keep it and if I click Save or click OK then it's gonna add some XML commands to the world file and it is actually going to be saved there. So this is why I'm telling you you don't have to worry about the XML language because you can actually add or create a world using your GUI and you can edit the world using your GUI as well. All right? And the commands are automatically loaded into the updated world file. All right? So we've got a model for the ground plane here which is basically the same models that we talked about or found in our world file. If you get here and you get like the worlds here and you get the empty world, you'll find that indeed there was a ground object, I guess. It was a ground, yeah, the ground plane model was loaded into here and we've got a sum model. I don't know if it's shown up in this GUI here. Maybe it's in the lights. Yeah, there is a, there's a sun object in the lights, uh, lights tab, All right? Yeah, and the physics engine uh, parameters. So if you look at the simulation right now, you can find that the simulation time is increasing. That means the simulation is, you know, is currently active and five minutes have passed in the simulation time. And you can find that there's also the real time, which is the time of my actual clocks. So you can find they're pretty close and that means my simulation is running fine because whenever the simulation time is so close to the real time, so I'm having a real time simulation. So my simulation, my computer keeps updating the states of the simulation regular, regularly within intervals that you know, keep the simulation quite close to the real-time uh, operation. So it's like a real-time simulation, right? Or a simulation that's very close to reality. You've got the foot per, uh, the, the frames per second, which is basically the frames per second on my camera, all right? Which is viewing the model here, all right? And we've got the iterations of the simulation. It's like, you know, the simulation is, is kind of a for loop that is, you know, uh, running continuously, updating or solving uh, the differential equations through numerical integration, and it keeps like adding or keeps iterating through uh, that, you know, the or these lines of code which are responsible for this integration and the update of the states of the model. So this is basically what the physics engine is all about, right? Without going into further details. All right, we've got the real time factor, which is you know the ratio between real time and simulation time. We can pause the simulation here. So my simulation is currently paused, 
right? And the real time factor is zero now, and I can resume my situation, my simulation. So my simulation continues to run. So that's basically the real world. Let's also like, you know, as I said before, whenever you want to investigate a new package, you just equal the roast topics and see what we have. So let's try the roast topic echo command or roast topic list first. So I've got a clock, and I did use that this has that this has something to do with uh, you know the simulation time. So I can rust topic echo a clock, for example. All right, yeah, that's basically the clock in nanoseconds and seconds. It has the two options. So how many seconds have passed? So this is like 479 or 400 is continuing to grow. So let's just say 500 seconds. So yeah, that's basically like eight minutes, which is, you know, the same uh, time that is uh, recorded here. So this is like an equivalent representation of the simulation time in seconds and nanoseconds, right? And we can do the roast topic list again, so we can see other stuff. We got a CMD vel command here, which means that we can control the velocity of our robot. Someone might ask, how can we control the velocity of the robot directly without, you know, having to deal with the robot dynamics? We said that masses and inertias are included, so we cannot, like, directly, kinematically control the robot as we did in the turtle sim simulation. Well, Actually, the robot has some sort of a control module, and we'll discuss that in uh, later videos. That you know allows the user to 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 like choose a set point or a velocity set point, and this module handles the dynamics and just produces the required set point uh, the user uh, wishes to have. All right, you've got link states, which has something to do with the states of the links. You've got model states, parameter descriptions. Right, some performance metrics here. You've got actually, well, this is uh, the fun part actually starts here because I'm not really interested in these states. Well, you've got the readings of the IMU, and the IMU is an actual sensor, it's like the inertia measurement unit, which includes some information on the orientation of the robot and its acceleration and stuff like that. So we might, you know, equal that topic or stop it, equal IMU. So yeah, we can find the orientation data. So our robot is like oriented. Uh, well, the orientation here is described in terms of something called quaternions. So we're used to the original representation of, you know, the angle about X, the angle about Y, the angle about Z, which is also sometimes called a rotation matrix representation. But there is another representation, which is an equivalent representation but it is different in terms of mathematical values. It's like a new kind of vector or something, or representing a rotation matrix through a vector. And this is a pretty complex mathematical subject that I'm not going through right now. But let's just say that this represents, or this quaternion here, which is the X, Y, Z, and W, represent the rotation of my robot relative to the global frame. All right. And we've got the covariance, and what the covariance is, it's simply uh, how strong my belief is. So, like, every sensor has, like, some sort of noise, all right? No sensor is totally accurate, so it has that sort of noise. So the covariance represents how strong that noise is. And whenever I have, like, a covariance matrix that is all zeros, then that means my belief is quite strong, actually, and the readings of the IMU are very accurate, because the covariance represents my uncertainty. And when my, when my uncertainty is quite low, that means I have a strong belief, so the readings of the sensor are accurate. You also got some angular velocity readings, and these are recorded not in terms of quaternions as the orientation, they're just about x and about y and about z right away, and I believe that is, uh, you know, relative to the local frame. The orientation, however, I believe it's relative to the global frame, all right? Uh, 
so when it comes to angular velocity we got low values you can find here 4 times 10 point negative 5 0.0001 something like 1.3 times 10 point negative 5 because our, actually our robot is not moving so I can deduce that these values represent the noise because the actual robot is not moving but the IMU is giving some little values which means this is probably noise the same goes for linear acceleration we've got almost zero values we get negative 7 times 10, 10 times oh yeah 10 power negative 11 3.6 times 10 power negative 10 and 2 point negative 2 point times 10 power negative 11 which is pretty small so I can deduce that these readings are actually noise, not actual readings, but the noise is pretty small, so I can deduce that my covariance matrix is almost made up of zeros. Right, we can rush topic list again and see what we have. We've got something called odometry. I've got the joint states, so let's rush topic echo the joint states, for example. Let's see what that topic is made up of. Sorry, what am I doing? Rust topic echo. And uh, we said join states, for example. So, um, yeah, it's basically describing like the joint locations, which is the wheel right joint and the left wheel joint, right? As we said before, the, their positions. Uh, yeah, pretty much nothing else. The timestamp, yeah, it doesn't have quite, you know, it doesn't show important information. So maybe you will find better luck with, uh, better luck with something else like odometry, for example. This sounds to be a cool topic, which is odom. And what odometry is, odometry is like, you know, measuring your kinematic states by dead reckoning, and that is equivalent to having your eyes or having yourself blindfolded and then uh, trying to walk and estimating how uh, how far have you walked right that's pretty much what odometry is about um, so it's like you know for example calculating the number of revolutions the wheels of the robot uh, had executed so far or the, the number of revolutions of the wheels of the robot so far and trying to estimate based on that number of revolutions how far has the robot moved All right so this is called odometry and well it's not the most accurate source of kinematic state estimation because there is something called slipping and there are some uh, you know the encoders that are located that compute the number of revolutions themselves are not very accurate. So this data is based on dead reckoning is like walking blindfolded, right? You don't have like an, a very accurate representation of how far you walked. You don't have like solid data. They are based on estimation. And this is why this data is quite noisy and will tend to deviate from the ground truth after a short period of time, right? But why do we need odometry if that's the case? We will need it later, all right? Um, all right, I'll just leave that for a later video where we will explain what the importance of odometry is. So let's, for example, Ross topic echo this odometry uh, uh, topic see what it has to offer yeah it offers something you know some of the data that the IMU offers like position but this position is represented in terms of X Y and Z and orientation the IMU only offer the orientation but the odometry topic offers everything because by you know by calculating the number of revolutions of your wheels for example you can determine how far you walked at the same time how much you've rotated because by varying the speeds of both wheels, because this is a, a, a two-wheel robot uh, configuration, you can uh, estimate how much you've rotated and how much you've moved forward as well. So it's both linear and angular motion uh, estimation. And you've got the twist, which is, you know, basically the linear and angular velocities. 
So yeah, you've got the position and velocity because by integrating velocity, you get the position. So as long as you can determine the velocity of your wheels, you can determine your linear velocity, the entire linear velocity of the robot itself, and the entire angular velocity of the robot itself. And by integrating those values over time, you can get like the actual position and orientation of the robot. But as we said, this process is not quite accurate because the velocity data is itself is faulty of sorts and has some noise embedded into it. And when you integrate something that is noisy, the noise grows like too large in the uh, in the integral. So, for example, integrating an error signal or integrating any signal would produce a bigger signal, most likely. So, when you integrate um, the error, the error would grow exponentially in um, the outcome of the integration. So the position will be very faulty. So assuming that you had a small error in the velocity estimation, the position error would grow large as time progresses. So we've got other, other values. We've got scan, we've got transfer function. There are a lot of topics that you can find here. Uh, well, we might estimate these, or we might equal these topics in later videos, but what I needed to do here is, like, provide, like, some sort of, you know, introduction to Gazebo, how it works, and what its features are. You can find another uh, Turtlebot 3 world here, so this is a different kind of world. We can launch it as well, so we might kill the original world, or the original Gazebo uh, simulation. And by the way, I forgot to say something. When you run Gazebo for the very first time, the simulation would load, would load very slowly. And you needn't worry about it. It's uh, Gazebo needs to load a lot of you know files initially and a lot of variables and stuff like that. So you needn't worry if your simulation runs uh, very slowly at the beginning. All right. Uh, we might actually you know import spawn a different robot here which is the waffle robot All right so we might export a new variable here so we're changing the turtle bot 3 model into waffle and then we're gonna lo load the uh, turtle bot 3 world simulation so uh, let's copy that and place it into our terminal and then hit enter so this is going to launch a different world. Yeah. So this is called Turtle Bot 3 World, right? And it's called Turtle Bot 3 World because like it's it resembles a turtle of sorts. So this is like a turtle shell and this is the head and this these are like the legs stuff like that. So it's like a world shaped uh, it's like a turtle shaped house for our robot, so this is like the bat cave of our turtle bot 3 robot, right? And it's one of the widely used simulation environments because the empty world is not very, you know, is not very useful when you're running simulations because you need obstacles in, in your simulation, when you need walls and stuff like that. So, I'm gonna kill that. I already explained the aspects of Gazebo, so I think we're done with that part. And yeah, you can actually try to export the Waffle Pie robot, which is the third type of Turtle Bot 3 robots, and try to launch something called a Turtle Bot 3 house, which is, you know, basically this house uh, structure, and your robot will be located somewhere here. Right? Um, and yes, we'll stop right here. Or maybe we we'll try something else. We might try the teleoperate. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a cool feature here. In case you want to move your robot, so let's just load our TurtleBot 3 world again. And just like we did before, uh, we uh, managed to move our robot within the simulation environment in the Turtle Sim uh, using code. Here, there is an option that you can move your robot pretty much like a game, like using the keyboard. 
that's through the teleoperate feature. So what I'm going to do here is roast launch something called the teleoperate package. This is the teleoperate package, and this is the teleoperate key uh, launch file. And this launch file, it like it just uh, you know launches some feature that allows you to move your total bot using the keyboard, all right, as long as your terminal is open. So if you could notice, the total bot three teleop was not present in the simulation files that we loaded, and this is because. The package that we loaded here is just responsible for loading worlds, all right, or simulation or gazebo simulation environments. But actually, we got other Turtlebot 3 packages that are responsible for navigation, uh, localization and mapping, teleoperate, and or teleoperation stuff like that. And you'll find that they are actually located within our ROS installation because the Turtlebot 3 is considered like a standard. Uh, robot uh, that is widely used by ROS developers so it's like you know its packages are already installed within the ROS installation alright so if you navigate to the other locations and computer then opt then ROS and Yotic so this is our ROS distribution and open up the share folder which includes all uh, you know all the packages that are installed with ROS, the, the, the complete installation of ROS or the uh, full desktop installation that we used before in the very first tutorial. You'll find some TurtleBot3 packages here like the TurtleBot3 description package, TurtleBot3 example, messages, navigation, slam, teleop. This is the teleop. So you'll find that the launch files here. This is the launch file for the teleop key. If you open it up, um, you'll find that you're uh, like launching some script, some hidden script that allows you to manipulate your uh, robot using the keyboard. So let's let's try this out. Let's copy that command here. So we're gonna copy it, and we're gonna load it into our terminal. Uh, Total bot three is not set. Oh yeah. Uh, here's the thing. Um, since we open a new tab, so the Total bot model is not loaded into the new tab, despite the fact that it was loaded into into the old tab. So I have to like export the model one more time into the new tab. So I need to copy. Uh, was it a Swaffle pie? I guess no. It was Waffle. So we're gonna export the Waffle robot into the new tab. It's like redefining the variable for our new tab, and let's just uh, run this command, and let's paste it here. So yeah, now we could launch the teleoperate feature, and to make it work, it just give it, it's giving you instructions here how to control your Teleport three robot. So if you want to move forward, you'll click W. So I will click W here. So what this does is that it increases the linear velocity of the robot in the forward direction. So once I press it, the linear velocity of the robot will increase. And if I keep pressing it, the linear velocity would continue to increase. Right? There is the S to stop. So I'll click S. And D to rotate like clockwise. And if you click D too many times, your uh, your angular velocity would continue to increase, and I can press stop again to stop, right? And the X for moving backward, and I can press stop again, which is the S, and the A for you know counterclockwise rotation. So yeah, it's pretty simple, right? So this is the last feature we're gonna test today, and I'm gonna kill this node. So yeah, the, the introduction to Gazebo is done, and you're encouraged to try these different uh, simulation environments and try to play with the teleoperate feature, or using the teleoperate feature, right? So that's all for now. To summarize what we did so far, we downloaded the TurtleBot 3 simulation package, which was available on the TurtleBot 3 e-manual online, 
and we did understand that what we downloaded was just the simulation package which included some files these files included the models and the worlds that we're gonna use for our simulations for the turtle bot robot it just like contains some environments that we're gonna use in gazebo but the turtle bot 3 actual packages which have to do with its uh, different navigation um, localization mapping and teleoperation features were all uh, already installed within our uh, ROS uh, distribution uh, we also launched gazebo and tried to understand its different features and files how the simulation is loaded uh, what are the GUI uh, tabs and uh, buttons and how it works uh, also we got introduced to the files and how these files are written and what information uh, they contain we also played with an actual robotic turtle uh, it is robotic not robotics and uh, that was the start of you know robotic manipulation of sorts in the upcoming videos we'll, un we'll begin to understand how the robot software modules work and we'll begin to write of these write some of these uh, uh, robotic uh, software packages ourselves.